Right. So I have started the Facebook live streams and recordings right now. If you're watching this from the live stream, there will be about uh, 30 minutes of lag uh, of the lagging. So, um, but don't worry, I, it should be fine. Um, okay. Let, let me leave the stage to to the speaker. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and also uh, for everyone to uh, for tuning in. Um, so I'll um, give a talk about uh, general relativity, black holes, and the the strong cosmic censorship conjecture. Um, and so, yeah, I, I won't presuppose any knowledge in general relativity. So the the rough outline of the the talk is that first um, I'll recap. Um, a few things about Newton's theory of gravitation. Um, and then we will um, go back to the, uh, the time before Einstein formulated his uh, theory of general relativity. And um, we will look at some thought experiments of Einstein, which highlight uh, why uh, special relativity and Newton's theory of gravitation, why they are incompatible. And what I also would like to um, try in, uh, in this next section is to um, motivate and give you some intuition for the, the notion of the uh, space-time metric, which is um, a key uh, element in, uh, in the formulation of general relativity. Some of what the, the space-time metric is in general relativity. Um, this would be the equivalent of the, the uh, um, Newtonian potential uh, in Newton's theory of gravitation. So it's um, a small uh, key object. And then um, towards the end of the talk, we using this concept of the, the space time metric, um, we will uh, we will formulate the the concept of a black hole, and then also um, briefly I'll tell you about the the strong cosmic censorship conjecture, which concerns at least in the formulation I'll present the interior of um, of black holes, and this is one of the um, the open problems um, many people work on at the moment in, in general relativity. So let me uh, recap a few things about Newtonian's, uh, Newtonian gravity. So Newtonian uh, gravity space is Euclidean. So this means that it satisfies um, uh, uh, Euclid's axiom, uh, axioms. So you can, uh, in particular, introduce a Cartesian coordinate system, x, y, z. Let's recall that a Cartesian coordinate system um, here is defined by the angle between the coordinate axis uh, being 90 degrees. And also you measure the, the length along the coordinate axis in the, the same units. Um, so here in particular, uh, for those people who are familiar with this notation, the, the metric, which me me measures um, uh, length and also angles, uh, can be written in this form, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. In physics, this is also often um, denoted as the, the line element, uh, since it measures um, length along, along lines. And then uh, we complement this Euclidean space in Newton's theory by an absolute uh, time, uh, which we call T. And then uh, we um, in theory they are related into of what we call an inertial frame of reference. And this would be a coordinate system that uh, consists of the absolute time T and then a Cartesian coordinate system X, Y, Z in which Newton's uh, equation of motion um, also where the, uh, the force um, exerted on a particle equals the inertial mass times the acceleration of the particle. The acceleration is the second time derivative of its position. So in particular, an inertial frame of reference is a frame um, in which if we do not have a force, then the acceleration vanishes, which means that the particle is either at rest or moves uh, with a uniform velocity. And here the, the mass um, is the inertial mass, and it's called inertial mass since it, um, you know, it uh, quantifies uh, the obstruction of the particle uh, um, to acceleration given a force. So if we have a high inertial mass, and this puts resistance um, uh, against acceleration if we apply a force. Uh, now let us come to um, the, uh, the law of gravitation in Newton's theory. So we have uh, two bodies here, one body with mass m1 and one body with mass m2. And um, here, this we would call the, the gravitational mass when um, we use it to compute the gravitational force. So the gravitational force between these two bodies, according to Newton, is given by g, where g is the gravitational constant, 
and then times the gravitational mass of the first body times the gravitational mass of the second body divided by r squared, where r is the, uh, the uh, radial distance between these uh, two objects. And so the gravitational mass sources the, um, uh, the, uh, the um, gravitational force between these two bodies. And then we can compute the equations of motion. Um, here on the left-hand side, we have the inertial mass. Um, inertial mass times A equals the gravitational force. And here on the right-hand side um, enters the gravitational mass uh, of the, the second, um, uh, second body. So this is the, uh, the equation of motion of the second body, um, yeah, M2, times the acceleration of the second body equals the gravitational force exerted by the first body on the second body. And now it's um, uh, a matter of um, uh, experimental uh, observation that the inertial mass um, seems to be equal to the gravitational mass. And if we assume that, or if we use this here, that the inertial mass equals uh, the gravitational mass, then these two m's, they cancel on each side, and we obtain that the acceleration experienced by the second body, A, is independent of the mass of the second uh, body. Yeah? So the acceleration is just g m1 over r squared. And this is something, <clears throat> this goes back a um, long time in history, and in particular, uh, Galileo's name is um, associated uh, with um, this observation that bodies um, experience an acceleration in a gravitational field, which is independent of, its ma of, their, of their masses. And Einstein um, coined this uh, term of the, the weak equivalence principle, which, um, yeah, um, which we can uh, formulate again, that the acceleration of a body experienced in a gravitational field is independent of its mass. This, as we have seen, is a direct consequence of the fact that the inertial mass equals the gravitational mass. So next, I'd like to discuss um, <coughs> two, um, uh, two predictions of Newtonian's uh, theory of gravitation, which are probably a bit uh, less well known. And they concern um, the, uh, the influence of uh, the gravitational force in uh, Newton's theory on light. And so when you go back to uh, Newton's time, then there was this you know, debate whether light is a particle or a wave. And now if we take the position that light is a particle, then we have just seen that the, the force um, is, um, exerted on a particle is independent um, of the mass uh, of the particle. So in particular, it doesn't really matter whether light has a mass or not, according to Newton's theory, we can compute the force uh, of the um, exerted by a gravitational body on, on a light particle, on a photon. And this is something this has um, already been conjectured by, by Newton. And there have also been uh, computations by Cavendish. They were unpublished and then published uh, computations by von Söldner. And what they considered um, was that you have like a, a heavy gravitating body uh, of mass m, like the, the sun, and then you have um, the photon, a light ray um, uh, approaching the, uh, uh, the body and um, approaching up to a distance uh, uh, b, and then uh, um, due to the gravitational attraction uh, of, the, of the sun or of this body, uh, the light ray is being deflected. You can compute the angle by which this uh, photon is being deflected, you know, just using the uh, uh, the, uh, the Newtonian force law um, we have discussed here, and you reach uh, the conclusion that the angle by which it's deflected delta v equals two m g gravitational constant over b the the distance the minimal distance of minimal approach um, over c squared where c is the the speed of light. And so already in the, in the Newtonian theory, light is being uh, deflected by, by gravity. You probably all um, are familiar with um, the famous expedition by Eddington in 1919, where um, he also observed the, uh, the bending of light during a solar uh, eclipse. And so what the, the news was uh, in this experiment was not that light is being deflected, but that light is being deflected by the, the correct amount. So if we um, look at Einstein's um, theory, then Einstein's theory predicts that the angle by which uh, light is being deflected is actually twice the Newtonian uh, value. 
And this is what was measured by, by Addington in, in, in 1919. Already in Newtonian um, theory, light is being deflected. And another uh, Newtonian uh, prediction um, is that of black stars. It was first um, entertained by um, an Englishman, uh, Michel, and then also independently by uh, Laplace. And what they considered was again uh, uh, a heavy uh, star, a gravitational body of mass m and radius capital R. And now you consider a small um, particle of mass m, which has a radial velocity v. And the question is, um, can this uh, particle escape the gravitational pull of this body all the way up to infinity? And this is, again, a classical um, easy computation. So what we um, just uh, use is that um, if we um, draw here the, uh, the gravitational potential energy, then here yeah, is given by the classic formula minus g m m over, over r. And so now in order, if we endow the particle with a velocity v and it's at a radius uh, little r, then in order to run up all the way uh, the gravitational potential to infinity, we know that the uh, energy, the kinetic energy it has at little radius r, one half mv squared must equal the, uh, the gravitational potential energy g m m over r. And so if we endow it with uh, an initial velocity v, then you know, just solving for r, we see that from uh, this value of r, it can just about um, uh, uh, reach uh, infinity. If the value of r is smaller than this, then it cannot reach infinity anymore. And if it's bigger, then it can reach infinity even with positive uh, velocity. So and as a consequence, if um, we now consider, again, a photon which moves with the speed of light, which is emitted from the star's surface, um, so it's emitted from uh, radius r and it has velocity uh, c. Um, then if the, the radius of the star is exactly this critical value, this 2gm over c squared, then light can just about escape to infinity. And so if r is um, slightly smaller than this value, so if the star is even denser, yeah, so the mass is fixed, if the star is even denser, then light cannot escape to infinity. So then light you know, travels out and at some point becomes tired and, uh, and falls back. And so for such a star, um, the star would appear to be black since the photons which are emitted from the star surface, they never reach infinity. So if we are an observer at infinity, then the photons emitted by the star, they never reach us. And so the star um, appears to be black. Um, and so two remarks. Um, so back, back in the time uh, of Michel and, and Laplace, this just seemed to be um, like a curiosity since if you um, put in for the, the mass the mass of the sun, then the radius uh, for which a star with the mass of the sun would appear to be black would be just about three kilometer. And this would be incredibly dense. So back in the time, people thought, you know, this could never happen. And the second remark is that the value of R for which the star of the mass M is, uh, appears to be black, we computed here using the Newtonian theory this actually agrees with um, the Schwarzschild radius of black holes and general relativity. So if you do the, the fully uh, general, general relativistic uh, computation. However, as we have just seen, and we will um, see again later, although the, the value agrees, the, uh, the, the physical interpretation is um, actually very different. <laughs> so here we have seen that you know, light is still being emitted from the star's surface, and at some point it becomes tired and, uh, and falls back. So in particular, if you have such a black star, if you come close enough to the star, then at some point the star will again appear to be bright since the light leaves the surface of the star. And this is something, uh, you know, which is, um, which is fundamentally different in, uh, for black holes and, and general relativity. So there the light, as we'll see it later, does not even leave the surface of the, the black hole. However, the value um, is the same. Um, so now let us um, come to the, uh, the time before uh, the formulation of uh, general relativity uh, by Einstein. 
So we, back then we had uh, Newton's theory of gravity and we had uh, Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity. And what I'd like to do in, in, in the session, uh, in this part of the talk is to show in which way these two are uh, incompatible. But first let's go back uh, to one of the, um, uh, the, the experimental shortcomings of uh, Newton's theory um, at, at Einstein's uh, time. And you know, Newton's theory back then was, um, and still is a very successful theory. And there were, um, as far as I know, there was only one um, discrepancy with experimental observation back in the time. And this was the precession of the perihelion of uh, Mercury. And even that was a tiny effect as we'll see. So let me tell you a bit more about this. Um, so if you uh, look at uh, the orbit of a planet around the sun, of the orbit of Mercury around the sun, so the um, two body problem, in Newtonian gravity, then the orbit is a closed uh, ellipse. And the point uh, of closest approach to the sun, this is what we call the, the perihelion. And now the observation is that the uh, planets, they don't move exactly on closed ellipses, but the perihelion um, uh, precesses uh, slightly with time. So this is what I've um, tried to draw here. So first goes round, here's the perihelion, then at the next um, round, the perihelion has shifted slightly, and then it shifts again. And this is a tiny effect. So what observations gave uh, is that the perihelion of Mercury um, uh, precesses by an amount of 5,600 arc seconds per century. And recall that an arc minute is 1 60th of a degree, and an arc second is 1 60th of an arc minute. So this is less than uh, 2 degrees um, per, per century. Okay, and um, actually you can explain the vast amount of uh, this precession uh, also within Newton's, uh, Newton's theory since the outer planets, um, they uh, exert a small gravitational perturbation on, on Mercury. And when you add up all these perturbations like of the, you know, Venus, uh, Mars, Earth, and so on, Jupiter in particular, um, then within the Newtonian framework, you can infer that the perihelion should process by 5,557 uh, uh, arc seconds per century. And so there was only the small um, amount of 43 arc seconds per century, um, which was unexplainable uh, by, by Newton's theory. So it's, you know, it's a tiny, tiny um, amount. And, um, but I mean, yeah, people were concerned about this. Um, and so they even uh, conjectured that one could explain this additional precession by another, by the presence of another planet, which was so far unobserved. And so they conjectured the, the planet Vulcan, um, which was supposed to orbit between Mercury um, and the sun uh, and should make up for this small um, uh, and so far unexplainable um, precession of, of Mercury. But yeah, needless to say, the, this planet Vulcan, um, this was uh, never, uh, never observed. Um, and so actually in the, in the uh, first paper uh, Einstein published on his complete uh, general, uh, general theory of relativity, that he uh, uh, showed that exactly this, <laughs> this contribution uh, can be explained by, uh, by general relativity. So Einstein's theory um, exactly closed this, this gap. So this was one of the, um, the uh, or the, the only, um, as far as I know, uh, uh, discrepancy between Newton's uh, uh, theory and, and experiment. And so for Einstein, I think this was not really the, um, the main motivation to search for a new theory of, of gravity. The uh, much stronger motivation uh, came from the fact that, um, like on a theoretical basis, uh, Newton's um, Newton's theory of gravity and his special theory of relativity, they are incompatible. And so we will see um, uh, one incompatibility right now, um, but also uh, you can also see the incompatibility by the fact that um, the uh, Newton's um, equations, they are invariant under Galilean transformations, while um, special relativity is invariant under Lorentz transformations. So I already see that these two symmetry groups, they, um, they don't uh, match. 
and also uh, in Newton's theory of gravity, gravity propagates at um, at an infinite speed, so it propagates instantaneously. So, for example, when you um, measure on Earth the gravitational field of the sun, and then you would just, you know, make the sun disappear, then the gravitational field um, of the sun would immediately uh, vanish on Earth, so it would uh, propagate instantaneously. While in uh, special relativity, <coughs> um, there's this postulate that nothing can propagate um, uh, faster than with the speed of light. So this is, um, you know, another discrepancy. Um, and now let me here um, uh, build up towards um, another discrepancy between Newtonian gravity and special relativity. This is uh, the first part here is a thought experiment of Einstein. And uh, it's about the gravitational redshift um, on, uh, on uh, photons. So the setup is that we <coughs> consider um, his uh, theory of special relativity. We have a Lorentz frame, T, X, Y, Z, which we set up at the, the surface of the Earth. And we restrict to like a small um, enough domain so that we can treat the, the gravitational field as uh, homogeneous. And then so according to uh, special relativity, distances in space and time, they're measured by uh, this line element, by this, uh, um, by this metric, um, Minkowski metric. And what we uh, now consider is that we drop a particle of mass m from some height uh, h. And now in special relativity, uh, the energy of this particle, which is initially at rest, the rest energy is just mc squared. Now we want to um, investigate the, uh, the effect of gravity. Okay, we, we don't, you know, back in the time, we don't have uh, a relativistic theory of gravity, so let us now use Newtonian gravity in order to um, infer the uh, trajectory, what happens to this particle. So Newtonian gravity, uh, we know energy is con conserved, um, so it, it falls, it has initially um, uh, potential energy mgh, and then when it reaches the bottom, all this potential energy has been transformed into um, kinetic energy uh, so that it reaches the, uh, the ground with a speed v equals square root of uh, 2gh. Um, so now according to special relativity, the energy then at the bottom um, is again the rest, uh, rest energy mc squared, and then to first order uh, in, in v over c, so we don't drop it from too far, uh, too high up, so the velocity it reaches is small compared to the speed of light. So then to first approximation, the energy of the particle when it reaches the bottom is m ski, mc squared plus mgh. And now we um, imagine that the particle performs a completely elastic uh, bounce, and at the same time, it's being transformed into a photon. Um, so the, the photon has a frequency at the bottom, a uh, new bottom, which is related to its energy by h nu equals e. And the energy we just um, established is roughly mc squared plus mgh. And now we send this photon uh, traveling back up in the gravitational field. Uh, and so we directly see that if gravity did not have any effect on the photon, then the photon would reach uh, up here the height h again with the energy mc squared plus mgh. So we could transform it back into a particle of, uh, of mass m, and then we have this surplus of energy mgh. And you know, we could repeat this and, and gain uh, more and more energy. So this cannot happen. So we directly see that um, gravity has to be, uh, or has to act on um, uh, photons traveling up into in a homogeneous gravitational field. And in particular, the photon, while it travels up the gravitational field, has to lose energy in very much the same way as a particle in Newtonian gravity loses energy when it travels up um, uh, a gravitational field. And we can also directly compute um, uh, the, the shift in the frequency. <coughs> Uh, just from the conservation of energy. So we postulate a conservation of energy that the energy the photon has at the top must be equal to the energy we started with, mc squared. And so then from this, we uh, can infer the frequency at the top 
so that h new top equals the initial energy e naught. So if we then compute the uh, the um, fraction of the uh, the frequencies uh, new bottom over new top, it's the same as energy bottom over energy top. If we plug this in here, then we get exactly this formula for the gravitational redshift. So we see that the frequency at the top has to be lower than the frequency at the bottom. So when a photon travels up a gravitational field, then it's being redshifted. And this was also experimentally observed and verified by Pound and Röpke and Pound and Snyder. So this was a thought experiment by Einstein. Um, the next argument actually um, uh, is due to Schultz later or after uh, the completion of Einstein's theory, but still it's a, you know, from, it's very instructive to, um, to discuss it now. So here in this scenario where the photon, the frequency was redshifted when it travels up um, a gravitational uh, field, we can now treat the photon also as a wave. And here I have drawn the, the, the Z direction uh, to the right and time towards the bottom. So this is when the photon climbs up the gravitational field. And now we um, treat it as a wave and we have the first wave crest uh, um, at time t equals zero and then the next wave crest at time uh, delta t bottom and you know the time between two wave crests is just one over the frequency at the bottom. And so here at the bottom the time between two wave crests is one over new bottom. And then the time that we would measure at height h between two wave crests is one over the frequency of, uh, uh, of the photon um, at the top. And so we see that since uh, new top is less than new bottom, we see that the time that passes between these two wave crests at height h is bigger than the time difference between these two wave crests at the bottom where we, uh, where we, where we started uh, from where we sent off the, the photon traveling up. And you see that this is clearly in contradiction with special relativity with the line element uh, taking this form since if it has this form then the time difference here should be equal to the time difference uh, here. So this, is, this leads Einstein's uh, thought experiment uh, to, to uh, this incompatibility between Newton's uh, theory of gravity and, and special relativity. Um, and we can also infer uh, something else from, uh, from this conclusion, namely that clocks uh, closer to the Earth's surface, they go more slowly than clocks higher up. Yeah, so this year measures a smaller um, a smaller time difference uh, than this one here. So this, must, uh, this clock uh, must go faster than this clock. Yeah, so as a conclusion, let me say again, so space and time are not measured uh, by, this, by this metric. Yeah. So now the question is, how do we incorporate um, uh, uh, gravity into special relativity? And um, to get a bit of intuition, um, I will discuss uh, local inertia frames, um, which then leads up to the notion of the space time metric. And for this, let us go back to, uh, to Newtonian gravity and the, the weak equivalence principle we discussed earlier. Um, so here we are in a homogeneous gravitational field. We have our Cartesian coordinate system, x, y, z, and absolute time t, and we consider a particle which falls freely in the gravitational field. And then the uh, laws of motion, again, take this, this form. Uh, a second time derivative position equals m and then here's zero, 0 minus g, so it's being accelerated in the z direction. And by the weak equivalence principle, the masses on each side, they, they cancel. Um, now let us trans uh, transform to a freely falling frame, uh, a sort of frame which falls itself within the homogeneous gravitational field. Uh, so we introduce new Cartesian coordinates, x prime, y prime, and z prime. Uh, where z prime here at time t equals zero starts from i uh, z zero and then the frame falls freely. And if we now consider the, um, <clears throat> the uh, equations of motion of a freely falling particle in this frame, uh, and if we compute the second time derivatives of x prime, uh, y prime, z prime, then we get this contribution from x, y, z, and then we obtain here from the ac um, uh, uniform acceleration of the prime frame, 
exactly the zero zero g which cancels uh, here the zero zero minus g and you know phrase differently if you are in a freely falling frame and next to you you have a freely falling particle then you know the frame and the particle they fall at the, the same uh, at the same rate so the particle seems at rest uh, or moving with the uniform velocity in the in the freely falling frame. So as a conclusion, in freely falling particles, uh, straight lines in a freely falling frame. So what we have achieved is that um, if we are in a homogeneous, and this is essential, in a homogeneous gravitational field, then by transforming to a freely falling frame, we can switch off gravity. So here um, I've drawn the, this uh, small cartoon. So if you are in a homogeneous gravitational field and you fall freely, uh, then this is uh, indistinguishable uh, from being out in space uh, when there is no gravity. Um, and vice versa, um, which follows from the, the same computation, but is not pertinent to the, the further development of this argument, is that you can't distinguish whether you are uh, in a homogeneous gravitational um, field uh, or whether you are uh, in a reference frame that is uh, uniformly accelerated. Yeah? So if you again perform experiments with spring and you drop stuff and so on, then uh, this exactly gives you the same um, equations of motion. So the, 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 the law, the form of the physical laws, they are um, the same in both frames. But let's forget about this. Let's um, think about this formulation here where we have found a way to switch off um, a homogeneous gravitational field just by moving uh, to a freely falling uh, frame. Um, and perhaps I should also um, briefly make contact to this first experiment again. Here, if you consider a freely falling frame and a freely falling Lorentz frame in this homogeneous gravitational field, then you can also compute that photons in this freely falling frame, they are not redshifted. Okay. So in a freely falling frame, everything looks like uh, there's no, no gravity. So now let us uh, try to incorporate this approach to a non-homogeneous gravitational field. Since what's important, all these heuristics and these Newtonian computations we did um, uh, just now, they they, they only work for homogeneous gravitational fields. But now, you know, usually we want to describe gravitational fields which are non-homogeneous. So for example, the gravitational field of the, the Earth. Um, and now this builds up to the, the notion of the space-time uh, metric. So on small scales, you can still treat the gravitational field as homogeneous. So you have here your 3D falling frame. And if you make the frame small enough, then in this frame, the, uh, the gravitational field is homogeneous, and you can treat this as a Lorentz frame, which falls falls freely. And in this frame, you know all your laws of special relativity, um, they they are uh, valid. But you directly see that <clears throat> this can only hold locally, since if you um, make the frame much larger than the frame up here, this would not be freely falling anymore. But the frame starting from here would fall in this direction. And so this exactly shows that um, uh, special relativity can only be valid um, in, in small uh, spatial neighbors of this uh, 3D falling frame. And what this means for the, uh, uh, for the Lorentzian line element for the, uh, the Minkowski metric is that this metric here, which we are familiar with from special relativity, this can only be um, valid in a small neighborhood. So if we go to larger neighborhoods, then we get perturbation terms. Then you know this is exactly what we would be um, you know somehow or analogously to the situation here that um, uh, time would not be measured anymore by by this uh, by this uh, metric. So if we go to to larger uh, radial distances, then the uh, the Ranci metric is not given anymore. By this form, the element is not given by this uh, form, but you have perturbation terms. And so this is the the physical um, formulation of special and special relativity is only locally valid in these three D falling frames. And you know you can do the same game for all three D falling frames. Um, and in 
all three defaulting frames locally, space and time, they are measured by this metric. And then if you go to larger distances, then you have these uh, perturbation terms. And what you can now do is to you know, cover all these free fall, free fall trajectories by these locally natural frames and then patch them all together. Um, you know, look at the appropriate coordinate transformations. And this is then what leads us to the, the mathematical notion of a Lorenzi manifold and of the space time metric. So what we have seen up here is you don't get globally uh, this Lorenz metric, but you only get it uh, if, you, uh, if you restrict to a free defaulting um, uh, world line. And so what you actually get, uh, if you patch all of those uh, 3D falling frames together, then this would be uh, the Schwarzschild metric, which we will um, uh, discuss uh, soon. So this was just the motivation why, in general relativity, um, the central object, which models gravity, is exactly given by this uh, varying uh, space-time uh, space metric. So we haven't said so far, or we haven't motivated uh, so far, um, uh, the form uh, the space-time metric gets. But we have deduced that in general relativity, the effects of gravity should be encoded by deviations um, of the, uh, the metric from the, the, the metric given by special relativity. I hope this um, gave a little bit of, of intuition. Um, now let me briefly summarize the main features of general relativity. So what we have uh, seen is that the fundamental object describing inertia and gravity, and as we have seen, inertia and gravity, they are treated on the same level in uh, general relativity, since you know, if you are in a uniformly accelerated frame and homogeneous field, this is exactly the same as um, in a, uh, being in a homogeneous gravitational field. But we haven't said anything about the, the laws the space-time metric has to satisfy. And it has to satisfy the Einstein field equations, which take um, this form here. And here on the left-hand side, these are curvature terms. Um, and this is really something, in order to understand this one, one has to learn um, uh, differential geometry. Um, so you can formulate uh, uh, equations which the space time metric has to satisfy. Um, and the equation is phrased in terms of the stress energy of matter, which appears on the right hand side. So this would be computable just from the, the space time metric uh, G. And on the right hand side, you have the stress energy of, of matter. And you can also show that uh, in an appropriate limit that these Einstein field equations that they reproduce um, uh, Newtonian gravity in the form of Poisson's equation. So this Poisson's equation, where you have the Newtonian potential, the plus of the Newtonian potential, is given or is proportional to the mass density. And so here you see this is second order in the Newtonian potential. Here the curvature terms, they're also second order in the space-time metric. And here also on the right-hand side, you have something that um, uh, comes from the matter, and that's the same here in the Newtonian, uh, in, uh, in Newtonian uh, gravitational um, field equations. Um, yeah, so I don't want to say anything else. Um, yeah, so one, one, can, one can motivate the form of the field equations um, uh, much more, but yeah, this would be, would be a separate um, talk. Um, so in the, the last uh, 15 minutes, um, I would like to uh, now use this concept of the space time metric to introduce the, uh, the concept of a black hole and then um, uh, introduce the, uh, the so-called strong cosmic sensor conjecture in general relativity. And first let us recall um, causality and special relativity. So in a Lorentz frame in special relativity, the yeah, x, y, z, um, t, we have this uh, metric, Lorentz metric, and now I use units where um, the speed of light c is equal to one. And then if you recall um, your basic knowledge of special relativity, um, then it said that if you have two uh, space-time events here, uh, P0, uh, just given by these um, uh, time space coordinates, and then P1, which is given by these time space coordinates, that um, an observer, um, so like a massive, um, a massive uh, particle or a human being, can go from space-time point 
P0 to the space time point P1 if the um, if the the line element is negative. So if the uh, the uh, length the Lorentzian length um, of the straight line connecting this point with this point is negative. So if we have that this relationship is rather T1 minus T0 squared uh, minus th this one plus the, the usual Euclidean distance, if this is negative, then we can travel, um, uh, then, uh, an observer can travel from P0 to P1. And if this Lorentzian uh, line element is uh, vanishing, if this is zero, then that's exactly the condition when the light ray can travel from P0 to P1. And then what we obtain here are these, these light cones. Here light travels at 45 degrees uh, the, from the boundary of this forward cone. And then all the, the points inside this cone, they can be reached by a massive observer so that we can find, um, you know, we can travel with the spaceship from there uh, to there. This is the causality in, in special relativity. Now for uh, general relativity, we have just motivated that um, the, the gravitational field is encoded by such a space-time uh, metric. And here the Schwarzschild I call the simplest solution is given by, by this metric here. M is the, the mass of the black hole. And we have also chosen units now to set the gravitational constant G um, equals to one. And to give you first some intuition for for this, since if you're not used to this, this can look uh, slightly scary if you compare it with uh, special relativity. So here where the line element is given in this form, if you now choose spherical polar coordinates, then um, here the Euclidean metric transforms exactly into this, um, uh, this line element. And if you now compare it with the Schwarzschild metric, you see the only differences are here in front of the dr squared term and the dt uh, squared term. Yeah, so think of, this year given in spherical uh, polar coordinates. Um, and uh, now you can choose a new coordinate, r star uh, of r, uh, such that the der derivative of r star by the r is given by one over minus two m r, and then introduce a new coordinate b, which is given by t plus r star, um, which you use to replace the t coordinate up there. And this is the computation you can let you do by yourself. What you then obtain is that um, the space symmetric takes um, this form. Uh, this form. And this is um, convenient since here in, in this form we had these singularities here at r equals uh, to m. This term here goes to goes to infinity. And in these coordinates, we see that um, the metric is, is well behaved. And now we we want to um, investigate the causality of this uh, space-time uh, metric. Um, so again, recall locally in a local inertial frame, the, uh, the causality of special relativity is, is valid. So what we can now do is we draw just the, uh, the VR uh, plane. So we just consider the uh, V and R coordinates and let us for a time being uh, forget about the, the spherical directions. And now we fix some value of R. And we compute again which directions are time-like, so which direction uh, does this line element give us uh, a negative uh, contribution, which directions does it give us uh, a zero contribution, so these would again be the directions in which light moves, and in which directions does that give us a positive contribution, so nothing can move in, in, in those directions. And this is, you know, again, uh, a straightforward computation you can do um, Later, later at home, so fix a value of r which is bigger than uh, 2m. And then here in the VR uh, plane, you see that um, the, all the vectors which are time-like, so along which the, um, the, uh, the, the Stein element is negative, they lie in this cone here, in this shaded cone. And then this would be directions along which nothing can travel, and this would be the past, uh, like analogously to the, the past light cone in special relativity. And here, the, this V coordinate um, is, is probably not so um, intuitive, but what is important here is that um, if we are at this point, then we can travel to bigger values of R. This is since the, the light cone has opened up at more than, than, uh, uh, than um, and zero degrees with respect to the v-axis. So here, this would be uh, a vector along which the, uh, the inner product is negative. So we can travel along this direction. And along this direction, we see that r uh, 
uh, goes uh, bigger and bigger. So this would be a direction which we are allowed to travel on and R goes to infinity. So here, if we are at value of R bigger than 2M, we can escape to infinity. Um, an observer can escape to infinity. And now the observation is that the closer we get to R equals 2M, the slide cone closes, uh, closes up. So it becomes uh, closer and closer to the v-axis. And when we are at r equals 2m, then this term here vanishes. And we see that <clears throat> all the, uh, the vectors which have negative uh, norms or along which the line element is negative, which we're allowed to go in, they point towards smaller uh, r values. And so this directly from this it follows that if we are here at the value of r equals to m and we want to go in an allowed direction where the line element is uh, negative, then we have to go to smaller values of r. And this is exactly um, you know how the concept of a black hole follows from um, uh, follows from such a space-time uh, metric. Since if you are here at r equals to m, you can only go to smaller values of r, but you cannot go any more to uh, bigger values of r. And also, if we now look at light here at r equals to m, then you know light can travel at 45 degrees. So it can either uh, um, uh, not forget about the 45 degrees that only applies in Minkowski spacetime, but here it can only travel along the boundary of the light cone. It can travel along here or along here. So it can just stay <clears throat> at the surface of the black hole at r equals to uh, uh, m, or it can go into the black hole, but it also cannot escape uh, to infinity. And this is, again, going back to the, uh, the Newtonian picture from before. In the Newtonian picture of the black stars, remember, light could escape from the surface of the black star. And here in general relativity, we see that light, if it tries very hard, it can only stay at the surface of the black hole, but it cannot, um, it cannot escape uh, from the surface of the, the black hole. So now in order to, <clears throat> so this was the concept of, of a black hole. Now to, um, uh, to discuss or introduce the, the strong cosmic censorship conjecture, we need to draw a different diagram. And um, this might be, might be um, challenging to understand. I'll give my best to explain that um, to you. Otherwise, please ask questions later if there's something unclear. And here in these diagrams, what was a bit confusing was some of this choice of coordinate, uh, the V and R coordinate, where you know, the light cones, you know, they go at this arbitrary angles. So now we draw um, a diagram where, so we choose coordinates such that the light cones, they are exactly at these 45 degrees opening angle we are familiar with from, uh, from flat space time. And at the same time, we draw a compactification of the, the VR plane. So we completely forget again about the spherical directions. We draw a compactification. <clears throat> and so this is the diagram. And here you should think of T going up and the radial distance to the side. And causality is now such that, again, light moves at 45 degrees here. And um, so here's, for example, a light cone, light moves at 45 degrees, and everything inside the cone can be traveled, uh, all the points inside the cone can be traveled to by, by observers, by uh, massive particles um, or people in spaceships. So T goes in this direction, R goes in this direction. A surface of constant R <clears throat> would look like one of these green lines. So if we are at radial, um, you know, coordinate distance, you know, so and so many kilometers away from the black hole, then uh, our world line would be looking like this. So we just um, uh, move forward in time and stay at constant uh, R. And this would be um, a world line even further outside, uh, further away from the black hole. So these are I equals constant, and they all asymptote here towards R equals infinity, which is the, the stashed line, um, you know, R infinity. Um, and here at R equals to M, this is this line. This would be the event horizon um, of the black hole, which was previously this line here. And here, this light cone, which I've drawn here, is exactly the slight cone here. Now at you know in the same 45 degree angle as we're familiar with from special relativity. So again, if you are here on the event horizon, then the only uh, only option you have is to travel further into the black hole. Um, while if you're out here uh, at uh, a surface of constant R, 
bigger than 2m, then you can still go at, um, you know, with less than, uh, or less than 40, 45 degrees, you can still go further out uh, to, uh, to values of R, which are bigger than the value you are currently at and reach actually infinity. So this here is the exterior of the black hole. This would be the interior of the black hole and they're causally dis disconnected in the sense that once you're inside here, and even if you move with the speed of light at 45 degrees, you can never reach uh, these observers at very large value of R outside here. Since if you're inside here and you go by the speed of light, you, you know, the best you can do is reach up here at the singularity. So this is um, this is what's called a Penrose cyclone. So one can you know spend an entire lecture um, on the on those. But um, I hope you get a rough intuition uh, for, for what I've drawn here. Um, and now the the Schwarzschild black hole, which we have uh, discussed, this is a spherically symmetric uh, black hole. So in particular, it's non-rotating. And uh, also one of the novelties of general relativity is that while in Newtonian gravity, it doesn't matter for the gravitational field whether the star whether the star is rotating or not. So, you know, if you have a spherical body, then the gravitational field is the same whether the body is rotating or not. In general relativity, there is a difference. So in general relativity, the gravitational field changes if the, the spherical star rotates. And in the same way, if you have a rotating black hole, then the, the, the space-time structure, the gravitational field is also different for a rotating, rotating black hole uh, compared to a non-rotating uh, black hole. And, you know, this is, you can write down loads and loads of formulas here. This is the reason why I've introduced these uh, diagrams. You can get an intuition for what is different uh, for a rotating black hole compared to a non-rotating black hole by looking at these diagrams. So this here, again, is the exterior of the black hole. These are the um, world lines of observers at uh, constant coordinate radius. This here was the event horizon. And here for the non-rotating black hole, <coughs> we have the singularity at r equals zero. So if you fall into the black hole, you necessarily hit the singularity and you're being, uh, being destroyed. For a rotating black hole, if you travel uh, across the event horizon and into the black hole, then you reach at some point what is called a Cauchy horizon, which is non-singular. So in particular, you're not being destroyed uh, uh, there. And now the, the funny um, uh, aspect about this Cauchy horizon is that um, when you reach this Cauchy horizon and the interior of the black hole, then Einstein's field equations, they do not tell you anymore what happens uh, to you after you cross the Cauchy horizon. So determinism uh, at the Cauchy horizon um, uh, breaks down. And let's recall that determinism is, um, you know, one of the um, the qualities of physical theory, which we value very much since, you know, if you want to send um, a rocket uh, or a spaceship from Earth to Jupiter, and somehow at least theoretically you can, you know, compute exactly the angle and the velocity at which you, you know, start the rocket from Earth, and then the theory tells you exactly what the trajectory will be and where around Jupiter it will end up. So this is the power of determinism. And exactly this breaks down uh, here at the Cauchy horizon. So when you go into the black hole and you cross the Cauchy horizon, then the equations, they don't tell you anymore what happens once you have crossed there. And so for some, this is um, uh, a very undesirable. Um, uh, feature. And also, you know, you're not being destroyed here. If you were destroyed, then things, you know, would be clear, but you're not destroyed. Um, there the Cauchy horizon. And Penrose um, uh, made the following conjecture, which um, goes by the name of the strong cosmic censorship conjecture, is that um, while there are these um, violations of determinism and general relativity, generically, determinism sh uh, should hold true in general relativity. So basically what this says is that, you know, this particular uh, uh, rotating uh, black hole, this particular solution, which is being represented by this uh, Penrose diagram, this is very ideal, idealized. Yeah, it's a highly symmetric uh, rotating uh, black hole. And if we um, perturb it slightly, so if we look at something that is non, uh, that is generic and not, uh, you know, non-generic, then the situation here at the Cauchy horizon should be resolved. So somehow determinism should be restored. And Penrose also gave um, a heuristic argument how um, this 
problem of loss of determinism at the Cauchy horizon um, uh, could be resolved. And this is the, the following argument uh, with which I would like to uh, conclude the, the, the talk. So here, this is again the Penrose diagram of the, um, of the rotating black hole. Here, this was our observer, uh, you know, uh, who stays in, in safe distance away from the black hole uh, at coordinate radius r. And here we have our courageous observer A, which um, travels uh, into the black hole, here cr uh, crosses the event horizon, and then uh, approaches the, the Cauchy horizon. And now Penrose's argument is the following. So imagine that the observer outside the black hole still sends light signals, you know, which travel here at 45 degrees. This is how we have drawn these, uh, or constructed these diagrams. Sends light signals to the observer A, um, uh, you know, in regular intervals. And the, uh, the crucial um, observation is now that here for B, um, an infinite amount of time elapses. So this observer here lives for, you know, for an infinite time, you know, just staying outside the black hole um, for an infinite amount of time. While this interval here for observer A um, is uh, a finite uh, time interval. Um, so in particular, you know, if um, observer A has asked observer B to, you know, uh, that observer B, um, you know, let's, uh, let's know about, you know, what the children and grandchildren and so on are doing and sends uh, a signal every, every 30 years. Then all these signals, they're observed by A in uh, shorter and shorter intervals. So the first, let's say, is, you know, the first generation, uh, she gets an update uh, about within one year and then the next generation is just, you know, 10 days and the next generation is just three minutes and, you know, it's difficult to keep up with um, reading uh, on all the, the updates on the, on the family. And so all these signals, these light signals or messages, they build up at the Cauchy horizon. So they all accumulate there in like a finite and shorter and shorter amount of time. And so you have this build up of energy uh, uh, close to the uh, Cauchy horizon, you know, which leads to an infinite build up of energy. And the idea is that this infinite build up of energy again leads to the uh, for singularity um, at the Cauchy horizon. And so the Cauchy horizon here, again, should turn singular and the observer should be, you know, in one way or another, um, uh, destroyed. Uh, so, uh, you know, in, in quotation marks. Um, and exactly how this uh, works out and making this rigorous, um, this is one of the, uh, the open problems um, uh, many people work on in, in, um, in mathematical uh, general relativity. So to make, uh, make rigorous these heuristics and show that generically determinism um, holds so that, you know, even in rotating black holes, you have um, a singularity uh, in the interior. Uh, so that, that's it. I hope you enjoyed that. And if you have any questions, please uh, do ask. Thank you very much. Um, so just before we move on to Q and A sessions, as uh, part of the organization, part of the people, there's a question that we always ask um, to the speakers, um, which is, um, uh, what reference materials would you recommend people to read onto if they want to know a, a bit more about the subject? Um, because um, the problem with learning stuff like this, for example, general relativity, is that it's sometimes very difficult to get started and we don't, like, um, many people don't really know where to start. So is there any mm -hmm. book or paper or any reviews that you would recommend people to read or? Um, it very much depends background. Um, if you have, uh, if you have some back, uh, like a stronger background in, in mathematics, then I think a very good introduction is the, the book by Robert Wald uh, called General Relativity. Um, if you have, uh, uh, like a mainly a physics background, um, then I think the the book by Woodhouse, uh, I think it's undergraduate Springer series in general activity. I think that's a good way to start. Um, uh, when you want to know more, for example, about the strong cosmic censorship conjecture, um, I don't think there are many. Um, good uh, references in books, so one would probably need to uh, read papers and then one could look at Penrose original papers, um, but that's, that's already a bit more difficult to read up on uh, from an undergraduate level. 
Uh, but yeah, I think like Woodhouse or Wall is a very good textbooks um, for generativity. Uh, right. Okay. Um. So let's start to uh, let's start to work um uh, work our way through the chats. Um. There are people saying that this is one of the best lectures that they've, they've ever had. <laughs> so good job doing it. Um. So, uh, one of the people asked, um, does tidal effect or spaghettification occurs in the uh, co black black hole? I'm not sure how to read this, but uh, um. Uh, yeah, so tidal effects, they, um, they always occur when you have uh, a non-homogeneous uh, uh, gravitational field. So if we go back to, um, uh, you know, to the gravitational field around Earth, tidal effect would be, you know, if you have a particle you drop from here and a particle you drop from there, then the freely falling world lines, they would converge, right? They would not stay parallel. Uh, and so tidal effect is observable when you, you know, you know, if they're very close together, then, you know, it's, it's nearly not observable, right? And they just stay uh, parallel. But if you put them further away, like one here and one there, then it's very clear that they are on different trajectories. And so the tidal effect would be how gravity um, acts on, you know, on freely falling world lines uh, when they are close, close together. Um, and so whenever you have a, a non-trivial uh, gravitational field in general activity, you do have tidal effects, um, and this would be encoded by, by uh, the curvature. Um, and so also in the Schwarzschild black hole, as well as in the curved black hole, you do have tidal effects. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, right, and um, there's also another question by the same person. Well, actually, it's probably not. It sounds like a more like a statement. He says that um, recently, strong cosmic censorship has been shown to be violated in co and R and black holes by Ni Michalis at. Oh God, I sorry, I, I don't know how to re pronounce this name, but uh, right. Uh, yeah, I mean this. This is um, uh, this is an, an uh, open, I mean an open problem. So there are um, you know various uh, works uh, which investigate whether the Cauchy horizon turns singular um, or not. I mean depending also. I mean, you know, <laughs> this this now goes back from the the, the the more basic level, like also whether you introduce a cosmological constant and what meta fields you uh, you use. Um, or whether the, the black hole is charged. I mean, th there are various um, uh, there are various um, uh, investigations, um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a problem that is still not finally uh, finally settled. And you can also think of it as different uh, solutions. Whether you just look at vacuum, whether you introduce charge, and so on. Um, yeah, so there are various possible outcomes possible. Okay. Um. So. Um... I hope that answers the question. Is there any more question from the audience? From the audiences? You can type the questions in the, in the chat, or if you would like, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask directly. Is there a relationship between cosmic sensitivity and information loss? Could you say it again? Relationship between cosmic censorship and information loss problem. Information loss? Problem and cosmic censorship. Sorry, could you, could you type it? I, I didn't get this. Um, while he's still typing his question, um, is, there, is there any more questions from the audiences? Ah, right. Uh, so relationship between information loss problem and... Oh, between, oh um, uh, 
I would say I would say no. I mean, um, the the information I mean, the, the, for the information loss problem, um, this would be um, yeah, there is no straightforward answer to this. I mean, uh, the information loss problem would be when the, the black hole actually evaporates, um, and this would be a quantum uh, mechanical um, effect. While the the question of strong cosmic censorship, um, you know, does not take into account any quantum effects. Um, so. If I um, start the sign by share again. Um, uh, you know, when, when you think about the evaporation of the black hole, then it's also very unclear what happens to the singularity inside. I mean, here the small singularity would not form at all. Uh, but space-like singularities, like for example in the Schwarzschild uh, solution, they would still they would still form. Um, so this, if you take into account the the, um, the uh, evaporation of the black hole, then you know this would this would um, I mean strongly alter the uh, what you would expect for the strong cosmic censorship conjecture about the null singularities, since this would not form uh, form at all. Um, so yeah, th these are already uh, different uh, different questions. Um, uh, the information loss problem, and the, I mean classically, the information loss problem would be uh, mainly concerned here with the exterior. So you um, start here at the, at the past, and uh, then you throw things into the black hole that evaporates, and then you um, ask what information is received here at the at the future. So this is a question which is formulated in the exterior of the black hole. While here the strong cosmic sense conjecture, as I phrased it here, is concerned with the interior of the black hole, with the, uh, the singularity there. I hope this, this um, answered it. Right. Okay. Uh, does that answer the question? Well, um, I will take that side on this as in yes. And so uh, uh, let, let's proceed. Um, is there any more questions from the audiences? Yes, no? Well, if not, I have one. Uh, I, I thought of one. So um, you've mentioned something like a rotating black hole. And mm -hmm. I think of black holes as some sort of um, so, so, the, so the mass of the black hole, I think of it as being concentrated to the singularity. That's the sole point where it will actually have some sort of um, uh, physical form of it. Whereas the horizon is more like a, a, a border that we define in which where um, everything we know would be a little bit more different uh, from, uh, between the interior and uh, whatever outside of this uh, horizon. But um, we have the conservation of uh, angular momentum. So if you have uh, if you have anything that's that has orig that originally has angular momentum, it becomes a black hole. I won't assume that the singularity would be a like sort of a real singularity that's sitting inside the black hole. But but rather a sort of like a ring. That's, that's, I, I think I've heard, heard of this concept. So instead of singularity as a point, you have yeah. a ring of sing, like a singular ring inside the black hole. Is 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 it is it that thing? Yeah, yeah. That, 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 there is um that, that there is this notion of the ring singularity, <clears throat> which uh, you would get if you um, continue across the Cauchy horizon in a particular way, and particular way means uh, analytically. Um, then you would um, get something which would be called a ring singularity um, inside the curve black hole. Um, but um, we would not expect that this ring singularity is physical in, in any sense, since um, at least for the uh, gravity, you would expect that this Cauchy horizon here becomes singular, and in particular, you can't continue at all. So in particular, you don't see this region where you have this ring singularity. Um, so this is discussed in, in many um, uh, older um, textbooks, but um, like the, uh, um, the 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 more recent research points in this direction that you know, this part of the space time is uh, is unphysical. So this is something uh, one should not uh, look at. And the other bit is when you when you said that you think of um, the black hole as that in, in the center there is this singularity, and you know then you have the black hole outside it. Um, somehow, 
uh, one has to quantify that um, a bit. And this is easily seen here in, in this Penrose diagram. Uh, that's since, I mean, there we actually do have a singularity, which is already in the black hole. Uh, but, you know, from the, from the diagram, you see that it's not the case that, you know, the singularity sits there and just evolves in time. And outside you have this event horizon, uh, which shields this uh, singularity. But here space-time is more, is more warped. So here at every time <clears throat> when you, you know, I mean, think of like a star uh, which undergoes gravitational collapse and you look at the time slice that goes to the star and then it follows, um, you know, you let time evolve when the, the star forms a black hole. Then at no time do you have like a central region where you have uh, uh, a singularity. But the singularity only awaits you when you evolve towards the future along the world line, then you do hit the singularity. But it's not the case that the singularity is there at every present time and it evolves in, in time uh, in the sense. So this is something you see from this, from this picture. Um, so it's, it's something um, one has to think about this, but it's uh, initially, initially confusing. Yeah. Right, yes. So that the conservation of angular momentum is not encompassed in the idea of a singular ring, but like some sort of in, in some sense sim uh, differently? Yeah, so the, um, the, the angular momentum of the gravitational field, um, uh, yeah, this, um, I mean, when you, when you uh, now think about how um, a rotating black hole would, would form, then you would have the rotating star, and then, of course, angular momentum is, is conserved, and then the star would collapse uh, further and further, and at some point, you know, perhaps, I mean, this is still not, um, not known, but we would expect that it also collapse in, in such a singularity, and that every time the you know the total uh, angular momentum would be would be conserved. Um, yeah, this, but you know it's 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 difficult to make a statement about the angular momentum of the singularity, since I mean this is where the uh -huh. the, right. the theory breaks down. That right? you can say the angular momentum is preserved, at, you know, at every time interval when the, uh, the, the, the rotating star collapses. Ah, uh, okay. Thanks very much, that made sense. Uh, so apparently we have another question from the audiences. Uh, what happens to your singularity when the black hole eva uh, dissipates and evaporates? Um, so uh, he, he, also, uh, he also says that, that all, like, if it lo lost, loses through energy to no, um, to no longer support the horizon, I'm, I assume he means if, if the singularity loses enough energy so that it, the, the horizon has to change. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we don't, I don't know, and I don't think anyone, uh, anyone knows that's still an open problem, um, uh, what, what happens there. Um, but yeah, I, um, uh, yeah I, I can't say anything to that. I, I don't think that, that, that's not, um, yeah, that's, that's um, you know, that's a problem for the, for the upcoming generation uh, to investigate these kind of questions. <laughs> upcoming generation of string theorists. Um, right. Uh, is there any question from the audiences? If not, I would say that uh, we can we can call us a day. And thanks very much again for giving this wonderful talk. And uh, we will upload the recording of this class to, um, uh, to the, uh, the, the Facebook and uh, we will have more com more events coming up. Uh, please remember to follow our Facebook page and uh, I'll see you um, actually not next week because next week's speakers, uh, speaker had um, uh, some medical concerns and he won't be able to give a speak uh, for next week. Uh, we postponed that class to um, the next term or the, or, or, the, or the Trinity term depends on the situation but uh, uh, I'll see you guys sometime in the future. And thanks very much again for giving this wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks all for coming. Bye. Bye.